It's a, uh, it's an honor to be here. It's a bit overwhelming because I have said there's three, there's actually four churches that when I know I'm going to, I'm just so thrilled to come. And I have said publicly in other places that this is the top. It's the number one, it really is. And out there is two of our, You really know who your friends are when you need them because they come through with you. And uh, it's good to have, I call, her my, <laughs> I call her my sidekick, and that's an affectionate term for my wife, 42 years, but I think she kicks me more than I kick her. Okay, so I may be her sidekick. Thank you, honey, for being here. You can be seated. I, I, I've, I'm so, uh, I get a little overwhelmed sometimes when I see, when I'm honored, Thank you for that. Uh, I want to get right into the word. We did not, I apologize for this. We did not bring any product with us. Normally we do, but uh, a pastor had invited me to be here in the morning, but I wanted to stay married because my wife had planned an Alabama, Tennessee football game <laughs> in her hometown, her hometown in Tuscaloosa, which we were there yesterday in a booth with some partners. And uh, it, I'm going to tell you a true story. They have a restroom in the booth, right? You know, it's uh, private. Every time I went to the restroom, Alabama scored. <laughs> Am I telling the truth, baby? Every time. And the, there's 25 people up there that said, would you just go to the bathroom and stay, please? Would you just go to the bathroom and stay? And I was cracking up because it literally happened. Anyway, thank you for the honor and thank you for being here tonight. I'm going to begin... And I'm going to do something a little bit different. And I think if you've never seen this in the scripture, it's going to open up your understanding to something very different. I'm going to deal with the subject of Satan's failing strategy to stop prophecy. Does anybody know where the very first prophecy in the Bible is found? Oh, since you don't know, I'm going to tell you. God gave the very first prophecy in the Bible in Genesis chapter 15, right at the time of the fall of Adam and Eve, when he said these words, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and thy seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. That is the prophecy of the coming Messiah. The second greatest prophecy is not found in the book of Genesis, but it is, it is recorded by Jude in Jude verse 14. Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied of these sayings, behold, the Lord is coming with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on the earth and against the ungodly. And it's interesting that Jode prophesied, I'm, uh, no, I'm sorry, Enoch prophesied that the Messiah was coming to earth to rule before he was ever born. So how do you figure that? That's the inspiration of prophecy. And so if you look at the Bible and you look into the scripture, I did a little research. In fact, my wife assisted me with this through Google. <laughs> The Bible does have 66 books written over 1600 year period of time by 40 men who were prophets and they were inspired of the Holy Spirit according to Peter. There's 1,817 prophecies in 8,352 verses in your Bible, which makes, makes the Bible 27% prophecy, or as some suggested, one out of every four verses in Scripture has some form of prophecy. Now, that doesn't mean it's an end-time prophecy about the Messiah. It can be about Christ first appearing. It can be a prophecy which was given to Israel. It could be a prophecy that was given to the church, for example. But out of all of those predictions that are in the Bible, out of the 1,817, one half of them have already been fulfilled. So someone asked me one time, what is your definition of prophecy as it relates to the Bible? There's different ways you can word it, but it is a specific prediction inspired by the Lord, given to holy men of God in advance, revealing what would happen in the future. And don't ask me to repeat that because that's a long statement. But it is when God pre-writes the headlines. And the amazing thing to me is that there are predictions that are thousands of years old 
that when they were written made no sense whatsoever. Like how can you put a mark on your hand or forehead and buy or sell? There was no way in John's day that would have ever happened. It's now done through computers. And this is just one example. How could every eye see the Messiah when he returns? You know that's impossible until you have a satellite and you have smartphones and cell phones and smart TVs. And now through a satellite, we can watch a war take place while it's happening. So every eye will see him. Those are just a few examples we could give. But my question I want to pose to you as we introduce this tonight is why is Bible prophecy so important? And we're not going to spend a lot of time on these, but we want to give you just a reason, a one-line reason. Number one, Bible prophecy is important because it reveals to you the complete plan of God from the time of restoration of the prophecy of the Messiah in Genesis 3.15 to when the new Jerusalem comes down on the new earth. It gives you a complete plan of God through world history all the way to the very end. Number two, Prophecy proves that Jesus is the Messiah. And that's one of the exciting ones. There's Josh McDowell once said that there were 39 Old Testament prophecies that specifically were fulfilled through Jesus. But if you take the ones about John the Baptist coming in the book of Malachi and all the others, there's well over 300 of the Old Testament that just deal with his Jesus coming for the very first time. You remember at the resurrection of Jesus, there were two disciples on the road to Emmaus and they didn't recognize him. He was resurrected and he began to, according to Luke explained to them from Moses and the prophets. Now, what does Moses mean? That's the five books of the Bible called the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy that Moses wrote in the wilderness. Jesus began to expound from those five books and then take the prophetic writings, which is such as Isaiah, where it says he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. He made his grave in a, in a rich man's tomb. He took those prophecies and expounded to them that he was the Messiah, and then their eyes were open and they knew him. So you have to understand that the Bible is so inspired that it predicts events about Christ's first coming, and that's how we can prove he was the true Messiah and not someone faking it. Number three, the Bible prophecy gives proof that the Bible is the absolute true word of God. Now, this is what makes it different than Islam, different than Buddhism, is different than any other religion in the world. Because the Bible is the one book, the one religious book, if you want to call it that, the one holy book, we call it the Word of God, that will tell you events that are going to happen in the future. That is lacking. This is important you understand that. That is lacking in practically every other religion in the world. Now, you show me one that tries to make the predictions, and you see, you got to understand something, that the Jews use the Old Testament and the prophets. They're using the same Bible we do. So when the rabbis give a prophecy, they're doing it from the same scriptures that we use. You may not be aware of this, but even in Islam, Islam believes in the Torah, the five books. Muhammad taught this. Their founder taught this. The five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They also believe in the Psalms that David wrote, and they believe in the four Gospels. But the difference is the Jews and the Christians would believe that they are totally inspired, those books. The Muslims have in the Quran, verses that are from the Bible, but they're changed. For example, Abraham didn't offer Isaac, he offered Ishmael. So when you ask him about a contradiction, which I have, most of the time they will say that the Christians and the Jews changed it to read what they wanted. But my point is that all three monotheistic religions that consider Abraham their father, it's Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, that consider Jerusalem to be a sacred place, it's Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. Judaism, that consider the Temple Mount to be holy. Christians do because of Mount Moriah is in the area. Jews do because Abraham offered Isaac on Mount Moriah. And the Muslims do based on an alleged dream, uh, I'm sorry, the night journey that allegedly Muhammad made to Jerusalem. And we won't get into all that. But the Bible, everybody say this with me, the Bible is the true word of God. So how can we boast that? Because of the fulfillment of the prophecies happening even in our time. That's how we can prove it. Number four, and this is where we're at right now, it, it reveals to us what will occur in what is called the last days. Daniel uses the term latter days 
Some talk about, prophets talk about the time of the end. Jesus talks about signs of the times. So there's about five terms used to indicate what will happen, what will be fulfilled during a specific generation. And these are called the prophecies of the Bible. Now, Timothy, we won't, we won't get into this, but there's something called personal prophecy of which someone like Paul went to Timothy and gave him a prophetic word that he should go pastor a church. And when he got to the church, the older people didn't like him because they thought he was too young. And Paul wrote him a letter and it's, it's in the book of Timothy. And he says this, with the prophecies that went before you wore a good warfare. He was saying, don't let them discourage you, but the word that God has given you, how many have ever had to fight with a word that God gave you? He gave you a, he spoke to your spirit. So there is that level, but we will not be in discussing that today. Now, here's what I've got to tell you. Lord, 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 how does the devil know? My God, Revelation 12 and 12. For Satan has come down with great wrath, knowing that he has but a short time. How does the enemy know his time is running out? And the answer is when he sees things happening in Israel. Let me, sh mm, I'm about to wax in the Holy Ghost in just a minute. Y'all bear with me because we, uh, this is the introduction. We haven't gotten to the meat yet, okay? This is just helping to lay out a foundation. Let me just show you something. I'm gonna show you how right before God does something big that is a fulfillment of something he spoke to a prophet, watch how the enemy steps into to disrupt it, okay? Before Christ's birth, right? Remember that? What happens Herod comes in and hears a baby's been born and sends in soldiers in a 10 mile radiance of a place called Ramah and has every child, and your Bible says under two years of age, slain hoping to kill Christ. Notice this, before Christ's ministry, publicly, where is he at? Matthew 4, Luke chapter 4, he's in the Judean wilderness being tempted of the devil for 40 days, and he, Satan tempts him to bow before him, and he'll, he's going to give him all the kingdoms of the world. So before this great ministry began, he has three temptations that if he'd have yielded to one of them, would have totally destroyed everything God planned. Then we find another example. The other example is at Christ's crucifixion. Boy, I wish I had time to get into this. It says that in Luke that he went into agony, and the Greek word is agonia, and his sweat became, as it were, great drops of blood. When you read the book of Hebrews, it says that he cried out to God. This is a weird verse. Not weird. I'm sorry. It's unique when you understand it. When he cried out to God that God would save him from death, and he heard him. And I thought, wait a minute. Jesus cried out to God, but he didn't save him from death. He died of crucifixion. And I start studying the verse, and it was referring to the Garden of Gethsemane, where his sweat became his blood, and he was about to literally die, and he had to cry out for God's will to be done, and God spared him from a premature death in the garden. If Satan could have killed him in the garden, he could have stopped the crucifixion. Then we go to the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. But we find out that before Simon Peter stands up and preaches that great message on Pentecost, what did the enemy do? He he tried to attack him. Jesus said in Luke 22, Satan has desired you that he may sift you with sweet, but I prayed for you that your faith would not fail. He tried to take the man of God down and out, discourage him. Peter denied the Lord, went out and wept bitterly, thought he'd lost the ministry, thought that it was over. But I'm telling you something, it's not over when Jesus has already prayed for you. God, don't let me preach that right there. The intercession was already made before the devil ever got there, before the trouble ever came, before hell ever broke out. Jesus said, don't worry about it. I've already talked to the Father. Everything's going to be all right. Oh, Lord. You may not be aware of this, but according to the early fathers, there was a man by the name of the Apostle John who was boiled in oil. They wanted to remove him. They wanted to kill him. And Domitian arrested John and put him in a pot of oil. And guess what happened? That hot pot of oil did not kill him. And when it didn't kill him, they took him out of that pot 
and took him to the Isle of Patmos. He was the last of the 12 apostles. Do you, under, do you understand the attack here? Satan says, let me get rid of the last man, but it's hard to kill a man that's under an assignment from God. <laughs> Ah, God Almighty, you better look out. This may go while I feel the anointing coming on me. Because it was Jesus that said to him, there's somebody standing here that will not die till they see the kingdom. And they thought that it meant that somebody would be living when the coming of the Lord took place and called him up to heaven. That's not what it was. Guess who saw the kingdom? It was John who wrote the book of Revelation. That's how he saw the kingdom. He saw it in a vision. And you can't kill a man on an island. You can't bite him with a snake. And you can't even threaten to chop his head off. And you can't and put him in a pot of oil because when God says, I'm not done with you, oil can't kill you, snake bites can't take you out, car wrecks can't mess you up, airplanes can't cut up your house. Fight with your assignment. Fight with your assignment. Oh. Let's go into modern times one more. And that is in the in the nation of before, before the nation of Israel is ever born, before it's ever birthed, before anyone ever thought there would be a nation of Israel. There was a seven year Holocaust. There were six million Jews annihilated, 1.5 million children, and it lasted for seven years. Satan tried to prevent the nation of Israel from being fulfilled by destroying the Jewish people before they could ever form a nation. But in, on May 14, 1948, Satan, too bad, so sad because it didn't work. Now, <clears throat> God, I want to say this to you because I believe what I'm about to say. And I'm going, to, I'm going to break this down real practical for a minute. Every time that you get a word from the Lord that you know is a word from God, you will usually engage in warfare. Ready? Personal prophecy attracts attack. God tells pastor, I'm going to do something. I'm going to build something. The Lord's told us we're going to do this the Lord, the, and when, you, when you announce it. But you know what? It shouldn't frighten you because the greater the battle, the bigger the blessing. And that's really true. That's not just a cliche. That's really true. The bigger the battle, you, you will come out of it and find out the bigger the blessing. But here's what the enemy wants to do. This is the goal of, the, of Hasatan, the fallen angel that has the kingdom of darkness that we battle in these last days. He wants to prevent the fulfillment of prophecy, and he wants to stop the fulfillment of a promise that God gives. So I'm going to give you four strange strategies that he attempted. This is going to be fun. You just stay with me. I'm going to give you four strategies that he attempted that had he been successful would have altered the course of history and likely this building would not be here and none of us would be here today. The first thing is this. Let's go, um, for example, in Genesis chapter 14, and you don't have to put this up. I'll just explain. It'll be fine, whatever you want to do there. But Genesis 4, 17, 17, verses 4 and 5, God chooses a man by the name of Abram, that's his original name, and then tells him, I'm going to raise, I'm going to give you a son. Then he says, now out of the son will come a nation. Then he says, out of the son will come many nations. Then he says, out of the son, all the nations, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Now, how can we be blessed by the seed of Abraham? Because Christ is the seed of Abraham. And the nations of the world have been serving him for 1,900 years in place to or Christians have in every nation. That's how we've been blessed. But notice this. So Abraham, or let's just call, I'm going to call him Abraham and Sarah instead of their first names, which is Abram and Sarah. So they come out of the land of Ur, which is somewhere in the country of Iraq today, and they head toward the promised land. Now, there is, and before I tell you what happened with this, there is a scroll, in a Dead Sea scroll that was discovered that described Sarah. And from when Sarah was 65 to 90 years of age, she was one of the most beautiful women walking the planet. You, you don't believe it? A 90-year-old woman could be that kind of a knockout? Let's just tell you what happened. Now watch, this is the enemy trying to stop the plan. Abraham comes into the land. He goes down because there's a famine in the promised land. He goes down to Egypt. Genesis chapter 12, Pharaoh and Pharaoh's servants see her, and they say, oh, hey, Pharaoh, there's this dark-headed woman that just came over the border. You got to check her out. So Abraham becomes afraid, and Abraham says, 
uh, to Pharaoh, who is the woman with you? So instead of saying my wife, he was afraid that they would kill him and take her. So he says, my sister. Now that's the dumbest thing. Cause think about this. Okay. If I say she's my wife, he'll kill me. If I say she's my sister, he'll take her. So you have two choices, lose your wife or die. Okay. I mean, the whole, the whole thing is okay. You didn't get it. I mean, it went over your head. It's okay. So you know the story that he was going to bring her into the harem. And then he is warned, warned by God. And he says, what are you doing? Why did you lie? And he said, well, I, I didn't really lie because we have different fathers, but the same mother, something of that nature. So, uh, I, look, I, look, can I tell you something? Just be careful in the Old Testament of not trying to practice what they did. Because <laughs> can I tell you something? There's some verses I'd leave out. Help me. There, there's some strange things there. You know, we're under the New Covenant, New Testament. Praise God, grace, mercy, glory to God. You know, so, I mean, I mean, I mean, back in that day, you, you'd get stoned for everything, and I ain't talking about stone getting drunk either. <laughs> I mean, anyway, let me get off of that. I'll get side. I get on these rabbit trails and I get off subject. So watch this. So then God plagues Pharaoh to prevent him from taking Sarah. And then 86 years of age, God said to Abraham, uh, and, and he, they've been waiting when he's 75, you're going to have a son. So he's 85 years of age. 10 years has gone by. Sarah has a handmaiden. She got out of Egypt named Hagar. You know the story. And she says to Abraham, well, it's very obvious that I am not the woman that's going to have this baby because I just keep getting older and you're going to be too old to have one before long. And so I, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to legally allow you to uh, take my handmaiden and you can take her for a wife and you can go in under her. Now you must understand that she, Hagar, was much younger than Sarah. And I don't know of no woman that would say, Take the girlfriend and have a baby. I don't care. <laughs> I mean, it's like, that's one of those things in the Bible I just don't get. You know, Pam ain't going to say, oh, go, yeah, Perry, get take a girlfriend. Or, and I'm not going to look at Pam and say, yeah, go, go take some guy if you want to have another baby. You know, you don't do stuff like that. Help me preach somebody. Y'all looking at me like, what? We're, I thought you were preaching on prophecy. Yeah, I'm preaching on prophecy. You just need to get through this part. You'll understand what I'm saying. And, and I'm going to show you a nugget here. So he does go into Hagar one year later at age 86, has a baby named Ishmael, which mean, God, means God hears. Here's what's strange about that. Did you notice that from the time Ishmael is born to the time Ishmael is 13 years of age, God hid something from Abraham, circumcision. He never revealed circumcision for 13 years. Isaac is born. Ishmael is 13, which in Judaism would be a bar mitzvah, which means that he is now responsible for his own sins. And God waits till Ishmael becomes a man on his own before he reveals circumcision. Why didn't God reveal circumcision to Abraham way back in the beginning? Because had he circumcised Ishmael at eight days old, he would have been the covenant child. Because circumcision was the sign of the covenant with God. So God hid it. Now, see, God even knows, watch out now, in your mistakes, how to get you out of your mess. Because he hid something. He actually hid it to protect the plan. Now, here's the third example. Okay, third example. <laughs> now, I'm telling you, I don't know what Sarah looked like, but she must, she, I mean, she must, look at these guys. They go down into the Gaza, Gath and Gaza area, and there's a king by the name of Abimelech. By the way, this is Genesis chapter 20. And he sees Sarah, and they say, take her into the harem. And Abraham says, well, she's my sister. For a man of faith, he is so afraid of this wife situation. I can't get it. God's man of faith and power. You know, Abraham, walk with God, man of faith, man of father of the faith. And Abimelech has a dream, and God says, you're a dead man, because that man's a prophet. And if you try to have a child through her, see, here's, what the, here's what's happening. Pay attention to what's happening. Satan is attempting to stop the birth of what would be Israel. Because Israel had to come through Abraham, not another man. It had to be seed of Abraham. The promise of the nation is given to Abraham. So what does he do? He's not going to attack Abraham except through Hagar's situation, which, by the way, that Ishmael... Uh, Isaac thing 
has caused wars in the Middle East for thousands of years. I mean, honestly, it, it just has. That's, that's, cause, that's, you know, brothers fighting. And they'll even tell you that in some Arab countries. We brothers, we have fought for many years. But my point is, notice who he goes after. He goes after Sarah, knowing that whatever this plan is of God, if he can get Sarah out of Abraham's hands, then she's the one the promise was given to. Have a child through another king. It literally disrupts the entire plan that God has. Anybody see that? Say yes, if you see what I'm saying. All right. So, you know, you know, uh, Abraham is 100. Sarah, I got to tell you this real quick. Sarah is 90. Isaac is born. Do you realize that Sarah is 127 years of age when she finally dies? Somebody add up a baby coming at 90, then you die at 127, and tell me how old Isaac was when Sarah died. I'm getting 37. Is that right? 38, 37, 38. I'm not going to, I'm not going to use the number I wrote down because I'm dyslexic with numbers and I'm, I'm always wrong. Okay. Let's try it again real quick. She dies at 127. Isaac is born at 90. So how old roughly would he have been? Say it real loud. 37. You're great. You're geniuses. Now <clears throat> I want to tell you something about this boy. Mama would not let him out of the tent. You ready? God had to take Sarah in order to get Isaac married. Now I can prove it to you. Don't get me on. This, we'll go on another rabbit trail here. But it says that they went and found a bride for him, brought the woman back, and he went into, he, Isaac, went into his mother's tent to consummate the marriage to be comforted of his mother's death. If Sarah had not died, the boy would have been a hundred and not been married. Come on, somebody. She's, he's, a, he's a bad mama's boy. <laughs> so, so sometimes, don't get me on that. Sometimes God got to do some different things to get things moving. Hallelujah. Okay, here we go. Now, that was plot one. So here we go. We're going we're gonna to go with plot number two. The plan to prevent Israel from coming into the promised land. Now, I'm going to read this verse to you. This is in the book of Genesis chapter 15. And I'm sorry, guys, I didn't write the verse number down, but chapter 15. God said to Abram, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and they will serve them and they will flick them for 400 years. And also that nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Now, this is a prophecy that Israel would go to Egypt. We now know what the prophecy meant, and they would be separated from the promised land for 400 years. When you count the time that Joseph was there, it totals, according to Exodus, 430 years total. Now, in that time, Moses is uh, uh, found in the bulrushes. You know the story, raised in, by Pharaoh's daughter in the palace, and for 40 years becomes a part of Pharaoh's household. Kills an Egyptian who's attacking a Hebrew, has to go on the run and live in the desert for 40 years till everybody who knows about him has died. God appears to him, watch this now, at 80 years of age, says, now go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. What's happening here is God is now going to fulfill the promise that he gave to Abraham that the 430 years are now up. It's now time for them to leave Egypt and go back and repossess the promised land. And here's the reason why. Because the promised land is where the Messiah would come from. The, prom the Messiah had to be born in a certain location and preach in Israel so they couldn't stay in Egypt the rest of their life. You know the story. Ten plagues had to come. After the ten plagues come, according to Exodus 12, 600,000 men, not counting women and children, scholars say 1.8 to 2.5 million people, they come out of Egypt in Exodus chapter 32. Uh, 32. Moses, at, uh, Israel's at the base of the mountain. Moses goes on top of Mount Sinai. God writes the Ten Commandments with the fingers of his hand. Moses, at the end of 40 days, brings those commandments down, sees them worshiping a gold cow. Now, the reason they worshiped a gold cow is in Egypt, there was Apis, or Apis, who was a bull deity. And it really was. It was a bull, and they made a gold bull, broke their earrings off, and Aaron's so crazy, like, like, like Moses is going to believe this. Where'd the cow come from? Well, they broke their earrings off. I threw the gold in, and a cow jumped out. That's what he said. A cow jumped out of the fire. Really? Okay, sure. 
So that got Aaron judged for that statement because that wasn't true. But the point I want to make is that he broke the commandment stones, right? You remember that? Then what a man. He returns back up on the mountain to talk to God. And I want you to listen to what God said. This is the most important statement God ever made to Moses because had Moses said, do it, everything in world history would have been altered. God says to Moses, I'm mad at them. They won't listen. They're stiff-necked in rebellion. I will consume them all and make a great nation of your seed or out of your seed, Exodus chapter 32, 10. Now, just think about this statement for a moment. Moses said to God, you better remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because you got a covenant and you can't go back on it. And it said God repented. It's in your Bible. God repented. What does that mean? It doesn't mean he said that God repented of sin. It means that God said, I changed my mind. You've caused me to change my mind. Now, let me talk. I was reading this the other day and I saw something. What if Moses, out of his frustration, would have said, do it? What if Moses would have said, kill them all, Use me. I'm fine with it. I can't take these people through here. I'm, he got so tired. Read it. He said, kill me. He told God one time, just kill me. I'm so tired of it. I can't put up with it anymore. Think about this. You had Abraham. That's one man. He has Isaac. That's two men. Isaac has Jacob. That's three. Jacob has 12 sons. That's 12 men plus the others. But it took 430 years to get 600,000 men. Moses, at that time, is 80 years of age. He's going to live to be 120 years of age, according to the book of Deuteronomy, and then he's going to die, and God's going to bury him at the base of Mount Nebo. Now, how many, how many babies could one man produce in 40 years with two wives? Did you say two wives? Yes. Believe it or not, Moses had two wives. Oh, I'm messing with you now. Here's who they were. He married, he married an Egyptian princess when he had a war with Egypt and Josephus tells you he was married to a dark skinned Egypt. Uh, I'm sorry, not, I'm sorry, Ethiopian woman. He married an Ethiopian wife. When he left, remember he killed the Egyptian and he ran. She didn't go with him. She stayed in Egypt. She didn't see him in 40 years. He comes back to get the children of Israel. She sees the plagues and she said, I'm going with you. How can I, can I prove it? The Ethiopian wife was in the wilderness because Miriam mocked his Ethiopian wife. And Marion got leprosy for it. How many know what I'm saying? Now, but wait a minute. When he went into the wilderness with Jethro, he married Jethro's daughter. Jethro was a priest. That's two different women. I don't have time to explain it to you, but both of those were in his life. Let's assume that Moses has two wives. It takes nine months to have a baby. Then another nine months to have a baby. He lives to be 40 years. I've told him he could, he could have about 80 kids. How long would it take for a nation to be redone to get it back up to 600,000 men? The same amount of time it took before, it would take hundreds of years and it would have messed up the Davidic kingdom. Well, let me just tell you this way. If Moses would have said yes, there would have never been a five books of Moses written. There would have never been a Torah. Or you understand he wrote that in the wilderness for 40 years. Number two, there would have never been a tabernacle built. If there'd never been a tabernacle built, there would never be the Levites. If there'd never been the Levites, there'd be no sacrificial system. If there'd never been a Torah, there would have never been types and shadows of the Messiah to prove that Jesus Jesus is the Messiah based on Genesis 22, Abraham offering Isaac on Mount Moriah, based on what Moses wrote about the ashes of the red heifer, based on what Moses wrote of the brass serpent hanging on a pole that was a type of the Messiah. You understand Jesus could have never said, I am in the law because there would be no law. I am in the Torah because there'd be no Torah. Had they all been killed, some of the prophets would have never been born. My God, are you hearing what I'm saying? Not only would the Bible not have been written the way it was, not only would there not have been a tabernacle, there'd not have been a priesthood, there'd not have been a law, there'd be no sacrifices, everything would have got messed up. But the Bible said Moses was the meekest man on the earth. And when God said, I'm going to kill them all, he said, you kill me. And God said, well, if I kill you, I ain't got nobody left. So God changed his mind, and Moses wrote the book and built the tabernacle, got the priesthood going, and said, there's a Messiah coming, hallelujah. So you can, you can never say that one man's obedience is not important. 
Ready for the third one? Here's the third thing he tried to stop, and this is important. He tried to prevent the birth and the lineage of the Messiah. God was so strict with the Israelites. If you've ever noticed, there were laws, there were judgments, there were statutes. Uh, there were so many things that God said, you have to, among the Jews, you need to marry a Jew. And people say, why was God so strict? Because God was strict in order to keep a certain bloodline trackable in the Bible to prove that Jesus was the Messiah. The bloodline was important. Now, if you've never noticed this, in Matthew chapter one, there is, <laughs> there's a lineage of, and my wife has this very unique study. She got called, and I'm not gonna get into it, honey, by the way, but she got into a very unique study. I did a Bible commentary on the genealogies, and I said, I, you just told me something I did not know. And Jensen, I'll tell you and Sharice later what she said. <laughs> Honestly, you'd get so hung up on it tonight that you wouldn't miss, miss the rest of the message, but it's amazing. Matthew chapter one, the genealogy of Jesus starts with Abraham and goes forward to Joseph, and that's the kingly lineage from the house of David. In Luke 3, it starts with Jesus, and it goes backwards to Adam, which is the servant or the human lineage of Jesus. Matthew 1 represents Joseph's house or the seed of Joseph. House, let me say it, house of David that leads to Joseph. And Luke 3 is Mary's lineage, okay? And that's all I'm going to tell you because the rest of it would get really do 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 That lineage had to be in the Bible. But I want to show you something. I'm going, to give you, I'm going to give you four things real quick, and I want you to kind of keep this in mind. One of these would be very long to teach, and I, I don't have the time to do it. But there's four ways that Satan attempted to dis totally disrupt the lineage of the Messiah and corrupt it. And the only way he could corrupt it was the Jewish people who were actual seed of Abraham, Levites who were actual Levites, marrying Gentiles and intermingling a bloodline from other nations, because God said, no, you have to keep Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You got to keep that all the way through to the Messiah. So let me give you the four. In the Genesis chapter six and verse four, there, there was giants in the earth before the flood when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and bore them mighty men of old. I don't have time to teach this. Please just believe me when I tell you that I've studied this for several hundred hours. According to Jewish history, according to the early fathers, according to 2 Peter 2 and 4 and also the book of Jude, God sent down angels in the form of men before there was a Torah to teach them how to live for God. When they took upon themselves human flesh, which was possible, read Genesis 19, the two strangers that were angels that came to Sodom. They looked human. The men thought they were human. They thought they were men. When they took upon themselves the form of flesh, they could do what flesh could do, and they became enamored with the daughters of men. They went into them sexually, and they produced a race of giants. And it would take me, I promise you, two hours to prove it from history in the Bible, but it's there. Now, what is that? Watch the verse. I will put enmity between you and the... He's talking to Satan, but remember, Satan came in the form of a serpent, right? I'll put enmity or strife between you and the woman between her seed and your seed. The seed of Satan was the giants. Goliath, Ishbibinoth, Saph, the giant from Gath. They, there were five giants in David's day. He took out the whole race, he and his mighty men. They were anywhere between 12, 10, no, nine and a half to 12 feet tall. And they were vicious and they were known as demigods. Now, let me say this to you. When you see History Channel, talk about ancient aliens and how the aliens came down. And they give you all these quotes from ancient Samaria, ancient Babylon. It's not aliens, it's fallen angels. And your Bible talks about it. Does that make sense to everybody? So there was a race of fallen angels. All right. That was the first corruption of Satan trying to corrupt the seed. What God did, he sent the flood to wipe out all the giants. And then he later, according to Jewish history and even to the Bible, fallen angels, God took them off the earth and bound them in Tartarus, which is the lowest hill underneath the earth. And there they are where they can't do that again. Exodus chapter 12 and verse 28, a mixed multitude came out of Egypt. What does that mean? They were not all Hebrew people that were coming out. They had married Egyptians. There was an Egyptian boy that blasphemed God's name and was stoned in 
the wilderness. And so in other words, God said and God knew that the mixed multitude, it says this, the mixed multitude fell a lusting. So in other words, when Israel was wanting the foods of Egypt, it was the Egyptians they had married that said, we want the cucumbers and the leeks and the garlic, and we want the fish and the melons. I'm going to tell you, onions and leeks and garlic will give you bad breath and diarrhea, okay? So what are these people wanting anyway? So, what was happening was the intermingling of the seed was causing a division in the Hebrew faith. That was another attempt. Daniel, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 7, verse 1. There were seven tribes. There was the Hivites, the Amorites, the Moabites, the Idiites, the... Oh, I'm sorry, that one wasn't in the Bible. I've met them then. I've met a few Idiites. Come on, there's a few Idiites in the church. Uh, and God said to Israel, he said, you're going, to have to, you're going to have to displace these seven tribes. If you don't displace them, they're going to be scorn, thorns in your eyes and scourges in your side. And the idolatry is what God didn't want. It didn't, it, God didn't hate people, but God said, they are idol worshipers. They're going to corrupt you. So there's another example of Satan trying to corrupt the seed. In the day of Nehemiah, the priest had married Babylonian wives. And Nehemiah went to all those priests and said, you got one or two choices. Stay in the priesthood and get rid of the wife, and you're going to have to stay single the rest of your life, or either if you want to stay married to the wife, you're going to have to get out of the priesthood completely. Okay, You can stay in it if you leave her. If you don't leave her, you got to leave. And that's where the one uh, uh, married, one of the priests married Sanballat's daughter. Sanballat was the governor of Samaria, and they built, this is all in Jewish writings, they built the temple on Mount Gerizim in Samaria, that the woman at the well told Jesus, we worship on this mountain and you worship in Jerusalem, which one is right? And that was a split that actually happened in the time of Nehemiah and Ezra. Now, don't miss my point here. The Bible tells you that the Messiah has to be born in Israel, Numbers 24, 17. He has to come from the tribe of Judah, Micah 5 and 2. He has to be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5 and 2. He must be born in the house of David through the lineage of Ruth and Boaz, which is recorded in Ruth 4, 21 and 22 and Isaiah 22 and verse 2. So what I want to share with you is this. The reason God was so strict is there was an attempt to mess up this lineage. But if you go to Matthew 1, and if you go to Luke 3, I don't know how he did it, but somehow God was able to pre preserve the seed from Abraham all the way through to Joseph, and he was able to preserve the seed of the house of David all the way to the time of Christ. And we know that Jesus is the Messiah because the lineage of the Bible praises it back. Come on, somebody, give the Lord a praise for that. So now this takes me to where we are right now. This is where this is where I wanted to get to for just if you'll give me about, about give me another six or seven minutes and I'll get this out to you, because I want to say, I want to tell you what's happening in the Middle East, and I'm going to explain it to you quickly without going into the major details it would take. A lot of people don't understand this whole conflict, and they especially don't understand the issue of Hamas being a terrorist organization, Hezbollah being a terrorist organization. ISIS being a terrorist organization, and they can't quite figure out what is happening. One country is behind all of that. One, one country called Persia, better known as Iran. You're now hearing it on the news how they provided weapons from North Korea and got them shipped in, and they provide, they provide the weapons, they provide the money. They're Persians. Now, let me stop and say some of the sweetest people I've met in all the earth in the United States are Iranian people. Many of them are Christians, by the way. Iran now has the greatest underground movement of God. I ask a man, I, I, I probably must, I, I'm going to need to be careful with this. Uh, let me, give me, before I say it, because I know this is just coming out on the internet. Let me just say this. The greatest underground movement church in the church world is in Iran, and it's being led by young women under 30 years of age. That's all I'm going to say. And there are hundreds of thousands of secret Christians, okay? So don't think all the Iranian people are bad. They are not. In fact, there are, many of them are good people, but they're leaders, which is 20% radical. But let me explain why. Everybody say this with me. Apocalyptic Islam. Three religions have... Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost now. I'm, I'm, we, can I have a little bit more time, Pastor? Because I feel the Holy Ghost is really wanting me to get this. You, you gonna give me, will you let me have a little bit of time? 
You really, you really need, this is going to explain the whole thing, okay? When, when Muhammad, who was the founder of Islam, died, the religion split between two of his followers. One was his son-in-law, and one was his first convert. The first convert took one branch of Islam, and the son-in-law took the other branch of Islam. And they became known as Shias, and some would say Shiite, and it's different pronunciations in the West, and Sunnis. The Sunnis are about 80%, maybe more. The Shias are probably about 20% if we total up all the other countries. Now, here's where it gets interesting, and I'm going to really reduce. Boy, we could get into this so deep and so heavy, and you, you, it kind of blow your mind. But Judaism has prophecies, rabbinical prophecies. Christianity has the Bible with hundreds of prophecies. But what a lot of people don't know is Islam has its own predictions of what they believe they are supposed to see at the time of the end. All right? Some of these are based on not statements in the Quran. They're based on the Hadith. They're based on traditions that were handed down by their, their caliphs and their leaders. The Persians believe, the Iranians believe, and this is what you'll, under, this is going to make sense to you. The Iranians believe that they must produce an end time war between the East and the West. They must produce it because there is a man coming called Al-Mahadi. -Ma Al Al I hear him talk about Al Mahadi, Mahadi. Al Mahadi comes riding on a white horse, appears with a white horse, appears with Jesus, makes a seven year treaty. I, I had a Persian girl teach me this 25 years ago from Persia. Okay? I was preaching from Revelation 13, the Antichrist and the false prophet. She said, We need to talk. All right? She was a Christian girl. They will be over the gold and silver. They will take over Egypt, Bolivia, and Ethiopia. They, will have, they, must, they must have a huge war in Syria, and they must take over Israel. They believe. Now, 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 just think about this for a moment. So you're in Iran, and you believe that you must create the biggest war that's ever happened, and that you're Hamas and Hezbollah, Give them all these missiles, and eventually you will destroy Israel and get that land back. And they don't, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say it because I know. I have, hunt, well, no, I won't say thousands. I've met thousands. I have hundreds of friends who call themselves Palestinian, and most of them are very good people. Most of them are Israeli citizens. They're Israeli Arabs. And even in one town, they've told me, if we said this, they'd kill us. We would rather have the Israelis controlling us because they don't have the corruption that our leaders have. Okay, so Hamas is a terrorist organization. Hezbollah, there's a, there's a political and military branch of all of these, but it's the, it's the, it's the military branch that's doing all the wars. So watch, the, listen to this, this is so heavy. So if they can win in Gaza, and if they can take over Israel, it means that their religion is true. Are you getting it? I'm talking about Persia. If, though, Israel survives, defeats Hamas, defeats Hezbollah, if they do, then what that means is what they have been teaching their people can't be true. This is a religious battle. It is not political. Everybody's making it political. It's religious, and nobody's talking about that. And where it's going, I, a pastor's probably shared with you because he knows prophetic things as well. I believe he's probably shared this with you. This war could go, not immediately, but if it goes bad for Persia, they will reorganize, and you will have Turkey and Persia and all those nations in Ezekiel 38 coming together at the war of Gog and Magog. And I've been preaching about that war how long, Jensen? 40 years. And I said, here's what's going to happen to get it here. And we're now seeing the early stages of what could happen to get it here. And here's the thing that you need to know. In that battle, it happens in the northern part of Israel near the Lebanese border. That's called the Bashan, the Golden Heights. That's in your Bible. It happens on the east part of the Dead Sea, which is the country of Jordan. And it also, it's going to, Gaza, Gaza is not even mentioned in those passages, which makes me think they're going to whip Hamas. 
Because Gaza is not mentioned in the Ezekiel. It's all north now. It's all Hezbollah. It's all north. It's all in the north. But here's what I want to tell you. Do not worry about Israel. Can I tell you why? Because they have in Daniel chapter 12, the archangel, Michael, who is their defender. Michael is the defender of the nation of Israel. And I've already read in Revelation, he can whip the devil and he's going to cast Satan out of heaven in the middle of the tribulation. And God says, God says in the prophecy, my wrath will come up and the world will know I am God. The bottom line is the Bible is true prophecy. The, Bi the Bible is the word of God. And this is the book you look to if you want to know the future. Don't go to a crystal ball. One psychic, one psychic, big psychic from California went to get an MRI and lost her power. True story in Modesto, California and sued the hospital for taking the MRI and losing her power. I would love to have that case as a lawyer. I could have said, you're a psychic. Yes. What you, you know, the future. Yes. Well, if you knew the future, how come you didn't know when they did the MRI, you were going to lose your <laughs> case closed. I want you to know something, though. I believe this. We're getting emails, and I'm going to wrap this up here in just a moment. But we're getting emails right now from people who say, I'm scared because I'm not saved. I've had people. I've had people write and say, I've been backslid for years. And I've watched 9-11, and I've watched everything. But when I saw this, it's like the Spirit of God came back to me and said to me, pay attention. I'm getting your attention. And there's going to be a massive number of people that when the Lord does come, that's going to go with him. But they're going to be people who've overcome. They're going to be people who watch and pray, people who look for him, the Bible said he shall appear. So here's what your mind needs to be on because a lot's going to happen. Real, the next couple months is going to get crazy. All over. But watch this. Number one, the gospel must be preached around the world and then the end would come. Help get the gospel out. That's, your, that's, prim, that's, that's number one. Whatever you got to do to get it out. Number two, the Holy Spirit's going to be poured out on sons and daughters. We're bringing, we're, I know Jensen, Jensen has a big youth thing every year. We're bringing Warrior Fest, our big Warrior Fest back to Cleveland. And did you, pre, you preached a couple of times there in the first of April. So we're getting back into this because if God's going to pour out this, his spirit on sons and daughters, I want to make a place, and Jensen does too, for them to be here. Isn't that right, Pastor? And that's, that's the second thing that you have to keep in mind. And the third thing that you have to keep in mind, and I'm going to say this to everybody watching me and those of you that's here, is you have to keep a repentant spirit. When my boy was on drugs and he was on alcohol and he was, I, I'm just going to say it, he, met, he was so messed up it scared me. I walked in and I said, I'm going to tell you something, son. I want you to remember this. I said, you might not be interested in trying to serve the Lord now because of your, your situation. And I know that. And you know that because you've told me that. But I want you to do this. If you ever feel like you're about to go, you, you just call out to God. Isn't that terrible to have to tell your kids that? Just call out to God because the thief on the cross, you know, the thief on the cross didn't even say a sinner's prayer, did he? Remember me. Okay. Jesus said, okay, we, you, I got you, brother. Two words. Remember me. It doesn't take forever to get right with the Lord. Ha ha. It just takes a sincere heart. But two things, three things, the gospel, the outpouring of the spirit, and doing everything you can to follow the Lord. Keeping, you know, keeping your eyes on the prize. Bow your head with me. I feel led to do this right now. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Lord, I want to thank you for this word. I just feel like this is the time, Lord, to give the people the opportunity to pray. Jesus. Hmm. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But everybody just lift your hand with me for a moment. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. 
We worship you, Jesus. We worship you. Mm. Take this message, Lord, that I have preached, please, and let people believe it with all their heart. Because whatever we do, if it's helping people, if it's serving, if it's studying, if it's ministering, we have a set time to do that. And actually, we have probably a limited time to do that, all of us.